Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, webinar. So the Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Uh, topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. So please uh, take time to see the website for more details. So before we start um, our talks today, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Aisha Litif. I am a lecturer and a group lead at the University of Manchester. My research is focused on tumor cell metabolism and my group is aiming to advance knowledge and find novel ways to exploit cancer cell metabolism for patient benefit. Today's webinar is um, titled Balancing Parenthood with a Successful Research Career and our invited speakers will be exploring the challenges and extensive opportunities that can emerge from effectively balancing your personal and professional lives. And a recent new parent myself, I'm really interested to find out about the perspectives of others on academic life and on uh, parenthood, and also gain some um, useful skills, tips uh, from their talks. So before I hand over to our first speaker, I would like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar. But please do send in your questions during the talks through the chat function. So if you have a question, please type in the question box as shown in the image on the screen and state who your question is for. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the uh, talks at the end of the webinar. So I would like to in, uh, introduce our first invited speaker today, who is Dr. Manveen Sethi. Uh, Manveen is a research assistant professor at Boston University, and she works in the School of Medicine, and her research work involves identifying and characterizing proteins and glycans using mass, spectromet uh, mass spectrometry techniques. Their aim is to understand biomolecular deregulation in human diseases, such as cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So by uh, from studying in India and Australia to working in the UK and USA, Manveen's uh, cross-cultural experience has played a significant role in effectively balancing her personal and professional uh, life. So Manveen, it's um, so if you're ready, uh, we can actually start your talk. And I look forward to uh, learning your tips for uh, balancing everything in academia and in motherhood. Thank you very much again for this uh, great introduction and thank you to uh, the Biochemical Society and Portland Press uh, for giving me this opportunity to present on this very interesting topic, uh, which is actually very close to my heart, um, balancing parenthood and a successful research career. Um, as being a, a more mother to two daughters, um, I think uh, this is um, this has been, you know, a thing I have been trying to do since I got, I had my first child, I um, embarked the parenthood. And most recently, uh, I just, I got my second, like my second daughter was born. So um, yeah, it's, it's been um, a whirlwind journey. And uh, um, it's very interesting. Uh, and it's very, um, I'm very happy to be here and sharing my, um, you know, uh, my journey and also if anything I can um, I can tell which can be helpful for people to uh, to you know uh, balance out the parenthood and their careers. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I am currently a research assistant professor of biochemistry and cell biology at Boston University School of Medicine. 
Um, I have been fortunate uh, to be mentored by some of the exceptional scientists and uh, more than that, extraordinary human beings. Um, from my mentors from Australia and current mentors at Boston University, uh, they have played a great role in shaping uh, my mind, which has helped my professional and personal development and uh, um, their um, advices and their they all being parents and um, uh, most of them being parents and their advices have helped me a lot um, in my uh, you know career to balance out my professional and personal um, paths uh, so I think having great mentors is first step in achieving that uh, my research uh, at Boston University uh, in, uh, includes roles of extracellular matrix in brain diseases, um, such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease, and glioblastoma, which is a kind of brain cancer. Uh, I work on uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry techniques, uh, including proteomics, glycomics, and glycoproteomics. Uh, to uncover structure uh, function relationship between protein glycosylation and underlying molecular mechanisms in neurological diseases. Uh, the overall objective of my research is to identify altered glycoprotein markers and also uncover therapeutic options um, to understand neurological disease pathogenesis uh, to expedite the clinical and translational research and discovery. Uh, this is just a, uh, you know, a very general summary of what I do before I thought, before I go into the actual topic, I just wanted to let you all know what I do. Uh, so I work on liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is a powerful analytical tool um, which uses the, which combines the separation capabilities of a liquid chromatography instrument and uh, analysis uh, capability of a mass spectrometer to uh, have specific and sensitive detection of wide range of molecules. So basically I start uh, with samples which in my case includes uh, brain brain tissues from human or mouse brains. There's a lot of sample processing involved and then there's uh, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry analysis where we get the data uh, acquisition and then the analysis and then we interpret the result to achieve my research. Um, so I was born in, uh, born in India, uh, a country which is multicultural, uh, yet where is, which is highly patriarchal country. Uh, the patriarchy holds the power, and uh, um, the women are women are pre presumed weaker. So um, and also the science. Uh, is not immune to such inequalities and disparities with only one third of uh, women researchers uh, globally. So in the beginning of my scientific career itself, I um, realized that I would have to work extra hard um, to fit into this challenging scientific world as a woman. And uh, um, I think um, in the beginning itself, um, I decided that uh, I need to really work hard um, and I have to balance um, work. I have to balance my professional life and uh, my personal life as a wife and a mother. Um, but and this balance is really important to embrace uh, your both scientific uh, career as well as your, uh, uh, you know, personal life. And uh, for me, this is just an example of my life events to just show you um, how it has been uh, and what all I have achieved. Um, so I did my bachelor's and master's from India. And um, then I did uh, did uh, work as an industrial placement in, uh, in at GSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline in UK. I also worked in India. And there I realized that I need to go for higher studies. And I did my uh, PhD in biochemistry in Australia. Uh, in the last year of my PhD, uh, I got married. And uh, then um, in 2016, uh, I was uh, give, uh, I was uh, given the opportunity of doing postdoctoral um, uh, fellowship at Boston University Australia uh, Austin University USA, where currently I work as a as research assistant professor. So I have been associated with Boston Universities for last uh, um, seven eight years. Um, during my second year of postdoc was when I got uh, when my first child was born, and uh, uh, as it is uh, assumed that with your um, 
child being born you get uh, um, you know you embark the parenthood you get career interruptions but in my case i think after my first child my um, career uh, growth exponentially i was uh, promoted um, to a faculty position in 2020 i did get some independent fellowship grants and then i was promoted to research assistant professor of biochemistry in 2022 and just last year i had uh, my second child so i think uh, uh, it uh, i have I think I have, with my both the child and my um, career, I have uh, tried to balance this out and I have uh, achieved uh, um, a lot of success there. So some of the key points for balancing work and parenthood, um, I think one of the key point is to build a support system. This is, um, something i have personally experienced it is very important to have a support system not just at your work but also at your home so you need to um, you know have a partner who's willing to contribute equally um, my for example me and my partner divide our works if i am doing uh, the cooking he's he does the dishes uh, he takes care of the older one uh, her bath, bath time her her bedtime and i take care of the younger one so it's very important to divide that duty and not take everything upon you it's also important to have that support system in in your workspace and in my case i think i have been very fortunate to have really really uh, understanding mentors who have supported me all through uh, you you need uh, mentors who can understand uh, you know what it takes to being a parent and you know you can have sudden you, have, you might have to take sudden leaves if your child is sick or you might have to leave from the work if there's an you know a call from school or um, if there is an accident or if your child is sick you know so, so some uh, very um, uh, situations can come up and uh, you also need some colleagues or you know support system in the work uh, in in the circumstances for example if you need to leave your work if your child is sick and you know being in the science uh, field you have experiments going on so it, it is it becomes sometimes uh, very very difficult and challenging to leave suddenly so you need somebody to you can rely upon uh, to have that you know kind of uh, support system who can take over your job if you need to finish something if you have to unexpectedly uh, take and take a leave or leave leave work uh, earlier than expected I think the other thing, important thing in balancing work and parenthood is to train. So you should train your juniors. In my case, being a research assistant professor, I train undergraduates, graduate students, and I delegate work to my team teammates. The other thing which could be done is share responsibilities um, with your colleagues, with your partner at home, or if, if it's not possible, um, then you can outsource help. You can hire people, uh, for example, to uh, you know help with your household or hire people to help with your uh, ex uh, scientific uh, work or at your professional front. Uh, if if your finances allow, of, of course, that's important too. The other important thing is to set boundaries and say no. It is very, very crucial to say no if you cannot do certain things. And this is true, again, for your professional person front. You need to say no when you cannot take upon things. Do not overload yourself. For example, at your work, if your collaborator asks for something which uh, in like, you, to finish some work in one to two days uh, but you know based on your routine as a parent and uh, all the schedules you go to all the responsibilities you have you're not able to do it in one to two days to so be transparent be clear and be out front you should tell that i cannot do that in one to two days i need a week to finish that based on my schedule based on my other responsibilities so it is very important and do not shy away uh, from saying no to your partner or your child if you have to so in your well-being your physical mental um, well-being is should be your priority so you should take that uh, you should do that and um, learn to say no plan in advance this is very very um, essential uh, when you want you're trying to balance your work and parenthood uh, planning really help even smallest thing like planning a day helps um, things like uh, experiments especially in uh, scientific fields like us um, you have, you know that you have an experiment coming up and uh, you know the steps you know the protocol and everything so for in my case i know i usually work one to two days 
uh, from home and then three to four days I'm at work and I can only work for certain uh, hours because I drop my daughter in the morning and then I uh, I go through the traffic reach work and then I have to come pick her up so I cannot afford to um, lose an experiment if I need to leave at certain time at the end of the day and I cannot afford to not pick up my daughter in some cases if it's needed and you know it gets really complicated due to traffic my husband um, uh, goes and picks her up but my husband usually takes care of the older one uh, picking her up from the school so we kind of communicate there so communication is another key um, right there uh, but I plan my experiments in a way so that I could finish it off in those hours so I plan like I break down my experiment in a way I could actually finish it up in those days and those hours if not then I have I train I have my students or somebody of my colleague to finish up for example a last incubation or last step uh, of the experiment so you know having that again coming back to the support system is also very important the other thing which might need planning when you have kids and you uh, you're a parent is uh, planning vacation planning leaves so that uh, so that you are aware um, you know your kids have uh, summer vacation your kids have uh, uh, spring vacations um, uh, and other uh, holidays uh, which you probably don't get um, through your work so you need to plan those things in advance whether you need a babysitter for that day or whether you have to take a leave so all of these things need to be planned well in advance uh, especially if you have gonna go away from vacation uh, being a parent uh, you need to have that out in the calendar you have to make sure your uh, uh, workforce knows that you're going to be away especially in case where you have to hand over the responsibility of something um, uh, crucial or vital you do in the uh, in your work area which needs somebody else taking place while you're away um, the other thing which i think is important is to prioritize your work set deadline, timelines and deadlines. This really helps me. So, uh, you know, put your um, put your to-do list, uh, Put have a calendar. So the calendar really helps me. I have my calendar usually full of uh, my next week plan or at least, or even a month uh, plan. I usually have my, uh, even my, da my daughter's uh, school events in the calendar so that I don't have conflicting um, uh, I don't have a, a conflicting event or a conflicting meeting with those. Um, set deadlines for yourself. Set those deadlines way in advance from the actual deadline. That really helps me. So I have a, a two weeks uh, prior deadline to the actual deadline because being a parent, you don't you do get some unexpected uh, you know hurdles on the way. So you have to be prepared uh, much more than you used to be. Um, uh, you know when you were not a parent, you didn't have a child. So I think that's very important. The other thing is prioritize. Prioritize what needed to be done first and what could wait. So because you cannot take upon everything. Um, so in my case, for example, even prioritizing what I need to do in a day helps because um, certain things like by like experiment like doing meetings um, or you know training students I cannot do it in um, you know later part of the day or remotely so I need to prioritize that and get that done during the day uh, so uh, but uh, so the things like you know reviewing an article or writing a manuscript writing a grant uh, things like that which could be done remotely I usually keep it for the end of the day because I like to uh, have a couple of hours in the night uh, to work upon these things re responding to the emails uh, but I would like to mention here that that um, couple of hours I use in more uh, in the night to uh, you know um, finish off the pending task is just out of my own uh, choice and uh, if you want to do that and if you can do it do it since I have you know limited time during the day sometimes um, go ahead and do it on but not at the cost of your health so I don't do it every day but it is something to keep in mind that you can uh, do you know um, you can balance that out um, uh, when your kids are um, to an early bedtime so you can have a couple of hours later on for um, you know to do finish up some of the, your pending work set a routine uh, this is very very important you need to have a routine for yourself and for your child because uh, as i just now i mentioned even having a fixed bedtime for your child helps uh, because that ensures that you get those couple of hours before you hit your bedtime um, to finish off some of the pending tasks 
um, setting a routine also uh, ensures you know what time you leave the house every day and what time you're going to come back so you have the power power you have that control over your day uh, to do things so so not mess up things uh, in that sense the other thing which i think is the most important of what i have told so far is to reach out reaching out ask for help uh, i think a lot of us are very embarrassed or very shy to ask for help but you know it is very very important reach out ask when you need to ask for help ask help from your partner when you know you're overwhelmed ask help at the work if you think you cannot do something um uh, given all the responsibilities uh, you're already tackling with um so reach out reach out to people ask for help um you i'll give you an example of reaching out sometimes um just it's not just about asking for help but it's also uh, you should ask questions ask ask if you're not able to do something if it can be done in the other way uh, example of this which is um, uh, which i was very very um, you know i'm which i'm very very proud to you know talk about is uh, so i had a grand due um, last year uh, in the mid december and my, and my um, due date for my um, second child was uh, in the first week of december and i was on track to you know finish off my grant and able to submit it by end of november but my daughter decided to come uh, earlier and uh, um, you know so i was not able to get those the grant submission on time uh, or at least you know i was already planning it in advance uh, so i was not able to do it so i just had this thought so i reached out to my admin and asked them that if they can reach out to the grant management and ask uh, if I could get an extension since I just have a had a baby uh, thinking of nothing else I was not I was almost sure I will not get that get that extent, extension because the grant submission has deadline fixed deadline but this was a foundation and they were very very uh, kind and when I got the answer back I was actually given three weeks extension um, uh, through the holidays to submit um, my grant and that was um, you know something I never imagined could happen so reaching out and uh, doing things sometimes really help sometimes you will get you will um, be able to do things or uh, get those opportunities you have never imagined could happen uh, so uh, I could submit the grant to, uh, to that deadline um, and I got enough time to actually uh, you know um, get um, get over the physical um, and uh, physical turmoil of delivering a baby and I can bond with my baby and I get enough time to submit the grant. So it was great uh, to, uh, you know, reaching out really helped me. And lastly, I think it is important to take care of yourself and remove the guilt and take breaks. Um, you, you need to remove the guilt. You need to self care. You don't need to think going to work uh, uh, and leaving your baby is something wrong. So you need to remove that guilt completely. Uh, you have to look at, you know, the bigger picture and you have to take care of yourself. You need to take breaks. You need to exercise, engage in activities you love and do not think that this is selfish. This is selfish, rather take, take it as self-care. So these things are really, really important. Um, engage in things that you're, um, you, you, that helps you mentally that helps you uh, happy because if you're happy you're able to balance uh, this work and parenthood more than uh, being stressed i think uh one more thing i would i wanted to uh, highlight here because i just went through this is um, maternity and research career and by maternity i also mean paternity it's not really for the woman but um since i am i'm coming from the maternity side i wanted to uh, uh give these uh, you know suggestions and uh, some of my um experience and share some of my experiences and what i think could help um I wanted this. I wanted to discuss this mainly because um, this study, uh, a study from 2019, actually mentioned that 43 percent of women and 23 percent of men in the U.S. leave full-time STEM careers um, when they embark parenthood. Uh, so there's about double double of the women who, who actually leave uh, their career, especially in the STEM field. Um, but I think if you have, um, if you take care of certain points. 
uh, you don't get overwhelmed and you don't get that uh, self-doubting going and that could help in not quitting. So some of the uh, advice or suggestion I would like to make uh, is um, right here. Uh, so before the maternity, when you know, you know, you get to know that you're going to have a baby, uh, it's important to plan plan your maternity or maternity leave well in advance you know when your due date is going to be you need to uh, plan when you want to start your maternity leave uh, when you want to end it whether you want to take it in part uh, like in part times or you want to take it full time how long you want to take it whether you want to take it everything all together or you want to break it down and take like two months previous uh, prior and then two months later on so these are the kind of things um, if you plan it helps it helps you planning and it helps your uh, workplace to have them uh, to to know that how long you're going to be away and whether you're going to come back briefly and then um, you could do some of the task and then you want you will be away again so these kind of things really help and it has helped me in the past as well the other thing uh, I did was uh, I tried to um, finish off and wind up my experiments. Um, I didn't keep my uh, really um, massive experiments or anything uh, which would require me to be in person. Um, I didn't keep it for the end. I tried to finish off one to two days, uh, one to two months before my mid, uh, due date starts. And also I uh, gave training to my uh, students and colleagues who can take upon some of the crucial experiments. And for example, I manage instrumentation uh, at uh, at my work. So uh, all of those duties you can hand over to uh, dedicated co colleagues uh, way in advance so that uh, the things keeps going smoothly and there's no hurdles back at workforce and uh, um, I kept like things like writing and other administrative work for the end uh, so that if you know for example the um, uh, you have your baby decides to come earlier than expected uh, you could put a pause on what you're doing and uh, you know focus more on taking care of the baby uh, and lastly I think uh, do not stress your work can wait um, the when you have a baby focus more on bonding with the baby and your physical and mental uh, well-being uh, and don't think much about the work uh, at that point. And once you have uh, your child, I think it's very important. Um, uh, uh, there are certain points you need to follow uh, to get that, uh, you know, security of leaving a child uh, and going back to the world. I think a lot of uh, uh, women, uh, especially I'm coming from the woman's side, so I can tell, feel a lot of guilt uh, leaving the child um, and going back to the workplace and also go through a lot of self-doubt. Uh, I think first step in when you're planning to go back to your work is to find quality child care or caregiver for your uh, child who you can trust. It is really, really essential. I think you should plan that well way in advance uh, in your uh, maternity leave, uh, when your maternity or paternity leave is going to end. You should uh, try out a few different caretakers um, and uh, um, choose the one you are more your you and your child is more comfortable with and um and whom you can trust and you can leave your child with because what if your baby or your child is happy and comfortable at a certain place you will be much more comfortable and you can focus on your work at least that that has been my um priority from the beginning um go for counseling therapy sessions if it's needed postpartum depression and uh, uh you know, stresses that happens after maternity is a very, um, very um, important thing and it's need to be handled with care. Um, the, there are counseling available at your workplace. Uh, you can take personal um, therapies uh, to tackle those. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling something, go for it. And uh, journaling is another thing you can do. There are gratitude journals you could write. Um, to have you know share your gratitude what you're thankful about in life that can help uh, with your mental well-being it is important i've said that a few times already remove the guilt you don't need to feel guilty to leave your child and go look do not self-doubt instead focus on self-care do not quit keep going 
look at the bigger picture look at the bigger picture from down the lane so if you have seen my uh, career trajectory look at look at what happened after i had my first child my career grew exp exponentially so i think it's very important to look at the bigger picture you want to set a role model for your child you need to be a go get getter not a quitter so focus on that and it is important and i think this really helps you if you if you are in self doubt and some uh, self doubt or something similar just revisit your career trajectory look at what have you uh, what have you achieved so far and what were your successes all through how much uh, work you have done to reach where you are so look at your career trajectory how much study you have done how much hard work you have given into you don't want to lose it in one go and look at what all the successes you've got so far and what you can achieve in the future so um, yeah so i think it is very important to keep these things in mind um, this is another topic i think which keeps coming up academia versus industry so which one is better uh, for you know balancing your career and parenthood i think to pick which side you want to be everything has its pros, pros and cons uh, academia you get flexible schedules but industries you have higher pays so it depends how your partner um, side looks like whether uh, they have higher salary so you can uh, manage with flexible schedule in academia or you can if you finances are more important you can stick to industry so it's important to keep these things in mind uh, to balance a parenthood um, there are certain grants which covers your child cares uh, some of the examples are right here bright focus foundation alzheimer's association awards uh, which are international uh, grants uh, provides child care support for attending conferences nih here in us also provides those uh, universities also cover child care support um, uh, some Certain universities have dependent care funds and um, grants for graduate students with children and postdoctoral scholar child care. Uh, so look for those in universities. Uh, you might have one in your university, uh, which could be very helpful, especially uh, with the uh, with the graduate students and postdoctoral scholars. Uh, many conferences also covers uh, this uh, child care grants. Uh, one of the example for me is uh, American uh, Society of Mass Spectrometry. Uh, I have in the past received their uh, stipend for um, to cover the uh, at home or on site child care. And this picture right here shows you in life sciences there are a lot of uh, uh, child care grants and on site uh, um, child care um, at the conferences. Even a European Molecular Biology Organization. EMBO has child care grants that cover child care costs um, for uh, attending the scientific meeting uh, funded by EMBO. And just uh, some a few last minute notes, uh, keep realistic expectation, acknowledge your career interruptions, maintain open communication, it's very important. Spend quality time with your fa family, take breaks and never doubt, doubt yourself. I think you can balance a successful parenthood and career. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you. And I think I have been uh, balancing my career and motherhood. And uh, it is a very dynamic, ongoing journey for me. And I hope I keep doing that. Thank you. And well, sorry. Thank that's fine. I mean, you. Thank you very much for this uh, very detailed and informative um, talk. You know, it, it is sometimes really helpful to just hear somebody else uh, reiterate the obvious. So in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next talk. Again, thank you very much for your time and effort into, it, into this. So now we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Tomkinson from University of Bristol. So Tim is a teaching technician uh, at University of Bristol at the moment. Uh, and I would like to introduce Tim briefly. So um, Af Tim has studied Theological Sciences at the University College London, and he graduated in 2006. Um, he has completed his PhD at the Open University, and um, he had two postdoctorate positions at the University of Glasgow. At the moment, Tim is working as a research technician in the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Brist Bristol, and his research interest uh, focuses on meteoritics and isotype geochemistry. Uh, Tim is a father of two and he is a member of the University of Bristol's Parents and Carers Network which aims to facilitate 
uh, mutual support, share experiences and signpost guidance to staff across the university. So Tim, this stage is yours. It would be really nice to receive um, again some hints and tips from the other half of the parenthood, uh, Emil's perspective on it, and uh, really look forward to uh, what you have got to share with us. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcoming uh, me to this uh, to give a talk here. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'll get stuck straight in, I guess. Was it? Uh, so my field of research was quite specific. Uh, my undergraduate geological sciences, as you're saying, but specifically it turned out I ended up working in the area of uh, Martian research. Uh, so from that, I looked at geology of rocks from Mars. So bits of rock that come from Mars. So we haven't had any sample return there from there, but um, we have had bits of meteorite, bits of rock that have been blasted off the surface of Mars and come back. And so I stayed in this field for my PhD thesis, where I was looking at um, the formation conditions of some of these um, minerals that formed in these. So the ones I was looking at was Allen Hills 84001, and carbonates like sort of like the lime scale you get in your kettle or something forms in the presence of water. So we're trying to find out when that water formed on Mars, how long ago, and how long it was there for. Was it there for just a few hundred years or hundreds of millions of, of years, in which case maybe then it would be sort of helpful environment for organics or life. Uh, but one of the things we had to deal with as well was looking at the issue of contamination and once these rocks had come to Earth, um, how contaminated they were. And I mentioned that because that will come up later in the talk, but this is just to give you a bit of a background of the field I got involved in before becoming a parent. And you can see this portion of meteorite, the one below it, in fact, is the samples I'm allocated. So we're working with very tiny amounts of sample and looking for these uh, these sort of watered altered minerals in there and also looking for contamination on a very small scale. Um, so believe it or not, that field of research, there's not a vast amount of posts uh, in it. So I ended up uh, finding one in Glasgow, University of Glasgow. And yeah, it was also looking at uh, conditions, um, ancient Mars looking through meteorites. So it was sort of perfect and it was too good an opportunity not to apply for as a lot of my colleagues had gone off to places like the States and further across in Europe. And my, my wife had just trained as a speech and language therapist in England, and she would have had to do conversion courses. So this seemed like a great post. And I was very lucky to get the post up in Glasgow. But unfortunately, it came um, at my wife's expense in terms of she had a great job with the NHS as a speech and language therapist. And she was being promoted very quickly and doing very well. But she realized the opportunities that were available to me uh, that this would be, you know, this is something she was up for pursuing and she figured as well that she would find work in Glasgow, uh, Scotland when she moved up there. Unfortunately, despite being well qualified, she found it quite tough in the job market there. And so, unfortunately, funds were tight. We, the other incentive was we moved out of my parents' place where we'd been living for five years. So, as you can imagine, she was quite happy to do that. But um, we managed to, with those funds we saved, buy somewhere that needed a load of DIY and stuff. So unfortunately, after coming back from work, it would just be more DIY. And my partner was obviously getting incredibly frustrated of this great career that she had had and that she'd given up for me, for me to pursue my career. She volunteered with Stroke Group, which was really helpful for her mental health. And then finally, after two years, she found a role where she, she got a pace as a speech and language therapist. So all was, all was good. Um, so at this point, then my son was on his way. Uh, the end of my postdoc was coming up, my three years. Um, it had been pretty successful. We got 10 papers, uh, three high impact ones in nature, uh, managed to get media coverage, a rather um, embarrassing video of uh, me talking on uh, BBC where I, they said it was just a rehearsal run, but it turned out that was the clip they used. But yeah, the research was going well, and it was getting traction, but unfortunately, my follow-up applications for grants um, while they were promising, it didn't quite cut through. And so there was a post, which I'd hope I could potentially do, which would tie over for when my son was born, uh, which was a couple of uh, pay scales lower, but I was happy to do it. But unfortunately, it was deemed that I was uh, overqualified, and so I didn't unfortunately get that post. Um, so sort of slightly concerning time with my child on the way and my pay standing, I went through the internal um, review scheme at Glasgow University where they put your CV into 
the pot for other potential employers and departments around the university to look at your skill set and see if you're suitable. And in fact, I got contacted by the dental school, which uh, deals um, with a post where it was looking at dental instruments and neurosurgical instruments and the levels of contamination on them um, uh, to see how the cleaning process was working and if it was sufficient, looking at uh, VCJD, which is sort of a mad cow disease sort of variant. Um, and so they kindly invited me to interview. I said that was very kind, but um, there seems to be a bit of a gap between you know, my background and potentially what they're after. And they said, no, 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 come give a presentation, tell us what instruments you use, and um, we'll take it from there. And I gave the presentation, and in fact, they said, yeah, there are loads of overlaps, apart from, in fact, you looking at sort of a more minute scale than we're planning to, sort of almost visual level. So in fact, your, your skill set's fine, and if you're happy, then, would love to have you on board. So I ended up jumping sort of complete career paths and working in this area where I was invited to give a talk within the first nine months at one of the world forums uh, on the re results I'd produced already in that period. Um, and yeah, all went well and those results ended up getting published. So it just goes to show that even though I thought I was kind of boxed in with such a niche level of research, in fact, the skills you develop in your research career can be transferred. Um, and sorry, here's just a highlight of the title, of the actual talk I gave. So that was all great, but my son turned up in the meantime, um, and they were fantastic, um, being flexible at uh, time, maternity leave. But my working hours, I especially shifted to try and get home with bath and bedtime. Um, and by this point, son was sort of, um, yeah, uh, sort of getting tired and grumpy and yeah, the sort of wind down for the end of the day. But um, so, yeah, the time I sort of spent, I didn't really, apart from the weekends, get to catch up with him until that sort of that final wind, time, wind up time. And yeah, he had been also got tongue tie, which unfortunately wasn't diagnosed quite a bit, fair bit later. So in fact, his feeds and stuff were irregular and that was causing a lot of stress to my wife and uh, to my son, obviously. And so we had to revisit the hospital because of the weight loss. Um, and this just put emphasis on family being far away, as we talked about earlier, you know, the support networks, they just weren't on our doorstep. Um, and my partner, even though she had found a job, she was not really enjoying it. And so we realized something needed to change. And so it was at that point that I mentioned Bristol, it was close to both our families and uh, lived there a bit and knew it was a nice place to potentially bring up children uh, but my wife also found a post there because she had given up her role uh, to come support my career it was my turn to do vice versa she found a post that she really liked and um, like unbelievably six weeks after giving birth she, she went down for the interview and with her well, with our son and her father in, in the car looking after her son where she had the interview she managed to get the job uh, she called me after she got the job, I was in the meeting with my boss. Um, she wasn't expecting to get it. She didn't think she had the qualifications or experience, but it turned out she was great, uh, which I knew she would be. But yeah, at the same time, I had to quickly explain to my boss there that I'd have to be giving notice because we were then moving to Bristol. And so we made the move and we managed to take our place in Glasgow and buy a do-it-upper in Bristol. And soon after, in fact, uh, there was a post in London that I applied for. I spoke to uh, the team there and the PI, the guy offering it, and he said there should be flexibility in the working, so I shouldn't have to be down there every day, which was fantastic. And uh, after interviewing, I was very lucky enough to be offered the post, but unfortunately, um, there was a catch that the HR team said that I needed to be in the post nine to five every day. And unfortunately, with the salary uh, and the cost of transport, accommodation and childcare, basically meant I would be just about breaking even. And I wouldn't really be seeing my family until the weekend. And my father had done the same when I was growing up. I had a wonderful childhood. But speaking to him sort of recently over the last few years, he's opened up a bit more about the strain that caused for him. And yeah, I just I was yeah lucky enough to be able to make a decision, but yeah, made that decision that um, that wasn't the lifestyle I wanted for us. Uh, so I ended up taking shared parental leave that actually turned out to be 
far more generous because my wife had been in the post less time. So the University of Glasgow sorted me out with shared parental leave. This was a lovely picture of me and my son. So one of my friends pointed out that there was um, a drill a tr drill in the background. So there turned out to be a lot of DIY. He obviously never touched that. That was moved instantly. But it was a bit of a mad sight uh, at home. And whereas previously when we'd done it vice versa, my partner really didn't enjoy that aspect. I, um, that aspect was completely fine with me. Another aspect I really enjoyed was play groups. Um, my wife didn't really want to over socialize, whereas I absolutely thrived on relentless tea, unlimited tea and coffee and biscuits. And this is pictures taken around Christmas time. I don't just dress my son up as an elf in the summer or anything that this was on theme. Uh, but we had a great time in play groups together. And he helped me out with shopping and chores. This is obviously feeding time where it always gets messy but unfortunately this time he actually didn't mind a bit of spice and so i included a bit of um, spicy sauce and unfortunately just after this photo was taken he ended up rubbing his eyes which was unfortunate so there were a fair few parenting fails along the way but we all got along happily and uh, yeah the balance seemed to work well for me and my wife and then our daughter came along uh, isla and this is my son going into kiss i think not to bite her um, uh, but yeah, obviously, I thought I'd crack parenting, but um, in fact, you never really do. And this was just unattended daughter for five minutes, uh, left with pseudocreme, which I didn't know she could access. And it turns out it's really hard to get that stuff off. Um, so yeah, always learning during parenting. And so with this period of time, you know, I'd obviously decided, you know, seeing that thing with um, commuting down and sacrifice of seeing my family as much. So while University of Bristol had been great, they'd offered me an honorary role so that I could still access papers and research. I wasn't actively in research at this point, apart from just following up with stuff from the University of Glasgow from my previous post. That was until I came across the Daphne Jackson Fellowship, which was a fantastic opportunity for people who had taken a career break um, of at least two years to either care for family or, or um, their children. And a really wonderful opportunity to get back into research. So I've, I've put down QR scan here. And they were incredibly supportive with numerous training opportunities. Managed to go to conferences uh, with them and even an international conference. I think the year before it had been in California and the year after it was in Berlin. The year obviously I uh, went to go present my results. It was in Glasgow again, so I managed to get back up there. And the only thing with the Japanese Jackson Fellowship um, in my case, I wrote my own proposal and it came with salary um, and um, time, uh, sorry, funding for going to conferences. It didn't come with research money. So University of Bristol very kindly gave me instrument time. And I also secured funding to go and use uh, instrument I needed to in France as well. But yeah, again, despite two SDFC, which is the Science Technologies Facilities Council, applications um one the first one very successful apart from my just missed the cutoff all the reviewers were very positive made those changes applied again and this time a different set of reviewers just didn't get it and um it was yeah unfortunately just too too much negative to be able to counter it despite the questions not really being relevant so unfortunately again unsuccessful fellowship so thought maybe this was then time again and so i came across then my current role which is as a teaching technician which just came up towards the end of my post and this was perfect in terms of with the parent balance I had at the moment I, I was I was drifting out of my hours a bit and my it's due probably with my time management more than anything else but this role really just allowed me to be involved in uh, working on the instrumentation for research and for teaching and helping out with the sample collections the rock stores which making them on available online which is something i'm interested in um and yeah day-to-day -day tasks sort of teaching on a smaller scale not large lecture rooms um and during quieter periods of years the university has been great allowing me to still continue with my own research i dropped down obviously the scale bands um but because i was going from part-time to full time actually the income coming in really wasn't uh, too much difference and sorry, this is just a picture of the samples and sometimes that we get to deal with. And so in terms of the career framework, 
I had been on the IJ sort of banding and I moved down to sort of GH, but there is scope to go back up to technical specialist and kind of fulfilling that already. So next year or two, I might be back up where I was, but in terms of day-to-day -day fulfillment, I'm, I'm very happy with this scenario at the moment. And my children now are nine and seven, they're becoming more independent. Uh, part of this place, I get to go on field trips with the students and help uh, collect samples with them. I finally got some job security so they were applying for grants and fellowships um because it's a permanent post and then able to help with the staff and also get involved in some of the lectures practicals um and most importantly i kind of keep my hours nine to five now there's really no drifting over which is fantastic at this type point in my life um and so also as well as this i said that i was able to get some funding for my own research i've got some uh scfc impact acceleration funding so i over the summer months, I have two months where I'm at my old scale research banding, and then they'd be able to come back to the teaching technicians after the uh, students return. And they've already been invited to present these results in September at a conference, and there's scope to expand this work. So despite going into a teaching technician role, I'm still able to be involved in research. It doesn't hasn't closed the door on that aspect. Um, and so there are other opportunities and possibilities out there for career paths. And just to highlight again, I think the things I mentioned that yeah child juggling parenting is crazy that the amount of things going on you know some things get more straightforward but then other things come in the way so it's just a list of things of just parenting let alone work on top of this it just shows how busy life can be so these are good years of our lives so it's so important to enjoy them I mean we all have different aspirations and goals so you've got to really just target what works for you and just yeah great time to do the things that you love you know being happy in yourself will then you know spread to the right those around you so like do not be afraid to create that time and make sure you eke out that time to be uh, to create that happiness because it say it really does help make a change and get that balance right for you in life but yeah with that i'll end this picture of my two kids the other weekend it looks like they're holding hands but i'm sure i think maybe my son's about to steal sunglasses or my daughter or something but this is closest to harmony as I think I could find picture wise, but uh, with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thanks very much for your talk, Tim. And, you know, it's really nice to hear another parent saying that, you know, uh, parenting is full of learning new things. And once you feel like you find your feet, there is another <laughs> challenge that you need to get over, that you need to learn. And it's constant learning, isn't it? So you're constantly developing yourself as a as a parent so thanks very much for this so in the interest of time we're going to move on to our next uh, speaker so before doing that i would just like to uh, let our audience know that um we're going to stay a little uh later after three to make sure that we can answer all of your questions for those who cannot do it because of their other commitments uh don't worry we will have these questions also recorded and distributed afterwards so um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Justina Hinchcliffe. So Justina is also from University of um, Bristol and she is a research associate um, at that university. So Justina is a behavioral neuroscientist in the School of Physiology and Pharmacology and Neurosciences. She has research interests in the field of behavioral uh, psychopharmacology and animal welfare. Uh, she is the mum of two and a member of the University of Bristol's Parents and Carers Network alongside Tim. So Justina, I look forward to hearing about your experiences and your um, suggestions. Thank you. I hope you all can see my um, um, screen. Hopefully it works well. Um, so that's kind of a very good depiction of uh, current um, creating AI images, which is very popular in everybody's scientific talks have. Uh, I would only say that I've got less children about more rats to actually uh, look after in my uh, work and life. So I just want to show you my kind of um, few ideas and what are the challenges for the research staff, especially the area career. Um, stages and um, what would be the, the, the actually advantages of being a parent and a scientist and kind of few funding opportunities that come up and they might be quite helpful for the parents and also kind of few advice tips 
uh, how to kind of navigate through the parenting and, and and your scientific career. So just very briefly about me, I don't want to go too much about me because I thought I would kind of focus about kind of more um and all the yeah bits that kind of more interested to people. So yeah, I'm a mum of two. I've got two year old and six year old. Yeah, they do hold hands in this picture, as I managed to catch that. And I also, yeah, I can always say that my husband sometimes is a fair child as well, which I also have to um, look after. So, like as you, as um, our uh, chair mentioned, yes, I work in, uh, in fundamental neuroscience from psychopharmacology and animal welfare field. I've been working for 13 years now. And I have um, mainly I'm looking at the behavioral models and more translational models of um, depression of how to measure um, emotional states in, in non-human animals and how to kind of um, develop better tests so we can test the new antidepressants, whether the new rapid acting, very trendy psychedelics, they're very promising compared to our conventional antidepressants, but also along the well, my kind of bread and butter pharmacology, behavioral pharmacology work, I've started uh, looking more and kind of more um, passion, uh, which is animal welfare, and how to improve our, um, how to improve the, oops, sorry, I think I switched off, um, yeah, uh, welfare of an, our laboratory animals, what to kind of refine more new techniques, and a lot of animal welfare work actually came up uh, during um, the period when I was pregnant, when I ex was expecting, I couldn't do a lot of like surgeries, I couldn't use lots of teratogenic drugs, and it be around the kind of more risky um, environment. So we kind of have um, come up with a convention, uh, sorry, con contingency plan for my research. So we, I did a bit more of my kind of, yeah, passion uh, for animal welfare and science. And a lot of this work actually came out very impactful and uh, we published in very good scientific journals and some of our methods are kind of well disseminated. So it's not always that uh, you all see children that kind of disadvantage your research that, you, you know, you suddenly your having children kind of changes your path of changes your field of your research and might actually be um, very kind of yeah beneficial for you and for your career uh, that slight change um so i've done my so i'm originally from poland i've done my bachelor and my master's research in again university in krakow again i was working in behavioral pharmacology then then i moved into uk where also i met my husband in the meantime um, and I moved into Bristol, I did my PhD in Bristol, and I'm still uh, we're Bristol working at the moment as a postdoc, I'm a research associate, and, and so yeah, I've spent quite a long time now, and um, I, I still co co continue my um, research in depression and uh, animal welfare, and I also, as you mentioned, I'm on a parents um, and parents network trying to improve our lives and kind of change the policies, kind of be more inclusive and help support our parents at the university, but also I'm on a, a committee, um, a kind of university parents association committee who runs the day nursery for, um, for staff and students um, of University of Bristol. So I have got quite a good insight from both sides, the parent from the nursery side and from the university staff member. And I found very um, interesting kind of uh, during the actually COVID and lockdown, a very interesting um, little quote from, from Twitter. Somebody said that sometimes being a parent is like um i'm going kind of, sorry ooh, read it now oh, my screen's not disappeared it's, it feels like um riding a bike on a really flat tire and i think it's very very um try very very um, precise that the description so be basically you're working as hard as you can you are exhausted you're sweaty you're so tired and everybody else you're passing you with ease so it is a bit like that you always compare yourself to other parents who don't have children or other colleagues who don't have children and you always think like you have sleep deprived, you're having the um, time for yourself, you're exhausted and you coming with the same outcomes or your career looks uh, exactly the same. But obviously that's um, that there's lots of uh, advantages and challenges in the scientific career. So first I will want to go to uh, just a very wild background. So um, I looked and on the view um, um, UNESCO's science reports, I look at the UK government census data, just a bit of um, statistics on women in science. And is it still majority of um, males are scientists, or uh, how how women are doing are doing in the scientific world? So the UNESCO reports show that one third of scientific researchers worldwide are women only, and only from those 30 percent, only 30 percent become a senior academic, which means they become associate professor, professors like PIs of the of the groups. And that I think sometimes I think that's kind of a bit worrying, and uh, there's lots of questions why that happens, and 
do we kind of getting that motherhood penalty? Do we do we do many uh, women leave academia and leave science because once they become parent, it's almost impossible to be both. Um, and also we know that women are very uh, underrepresented uh, in STEM education. So in from the UK data, we know only 27 percent graduate um, university in STEM, 26% only works in the um, in UK if, um, when they're coming from the um, STEM workforce. So that's very low percentage. It's almost like one, one quarter of all scientists and uh, just uh, obviously just women. And um, when we look at the kind of uh, the graph on the bottom, I'm sure you will see, um, it's we kind of more or less in the middle um, of that. This is the graph, graph for the Europe. And we are about 39%. That's the females of total female researchers of total of um, scientists. And that's not um, yeah, that's not a very high number, maybe a bit more than worldwide. But still, we, we can see the majority of scientists are males and not females. And I think I had similar um kind of um um data we, like Mavin showed us that um about 34% of mothers and 12% of fathers leave full-time STEM employment after becoming scientists. So uh, after becoming parents, the scientists. So why is that happen? Why why we got uh, so many women leaving uh, academia or leaving full time jobs when they become moms? So I think I've got a few lists of um, yeah the challenges for the research staff, and I don't want to be too too pessimistic, but I'm just trying to be a bit realistic. What is actually um, yeah what is actually how hard it is to be a research staff in academia, especially a mother and um, scientist. So we know that especially in the early college stages, especially when you become a postdoc, the financial instability and job precarity is always the, the big problem. The short term fund grant funded uh, contract, the same for the um, technical staff. Obviously, you, you start your new contract and you have to look at what's next, when you're going to apply for another grant, when you're going to fund another job. Um, around it again, um, looking at the eligibility to maternity paternity leave again. If you start new contract, can you get maternity leave? Can, when you let's say become pregnant at the end of your uh, your contract, what about your paternity leave? Do you get any any um, financial support? And again, obviously we know difficult to settle down. Obviously buy property when you have to um, kind of be very short term contract. It's very hard to get mortgage. Very hard to kind of save money when you have to pay a lot for the for the rent, moving to different universities and um, Another thing to add to it is like academic mobility. We always suggest that we should move around from university, get new experience, learn new skills, and kind of move from place to place. But that again is very difficult and very based on your personal situation. So who's the main breadwinner in the household? If you do both academics, really hard to find a um, job in the same university on the um, opening positions, they very well in two, three. Um, job opportunities at the same time. So, like uh, in yeah, Tim showed us that it's very really hard to kind of manage one person, the other person, to find a job in the same place. And it also, again, depends what your yeah second half job and type. So, we see, I'm academic. My husband is working for a PR agency. So, it's really hard to kind of move around. If he's got a good job, I can't really move somewhere else. And obviously, if he's a breadwinner or whether I'm bread, main breadwinner, it's really hard to kind of juggle that, make that decision to move away from different uh, from different location to different place to to find better jobs or kind of yeah have your great uh, professional career development and another thing that ties to it is provision of childcare and access to local schools and um we know it's very um yeah it's very hard and that's obviously a national problem it's not just yeah let's say in bristol and we know for example i know from our nursery we've got 12 to 18 months um waiting list to get to place the nursery which is absolutely uh, crazy as you think about that if you want to have with any visiting academics or any short-term contract staff coming to Bristol um it's almost impossible to come in with your family if you, with, with your with your children because obviously there's you have to find different local nurseries you can't use the let's say university one and the same access to local school obviously everything is uh, oversubscribed is is struggle to find local school someone that is more or less relatively close to your work and your home so yeah that's kind of more national program pro, uh, problem but it's definitely a big um, yeah, impactful um, thing that adds to the challenges to being in the research staff. And um, another thing is cost of um, conference travel and field trips and workshops. And it's not only financial costs. Let's say if you work uh, part time, um, yeah, you obviously have to find and arrange the childcare. But let's say if you go for three, four days, if you work part time, you have to cover those few days. If you're very privileged and you're lucky, you've got your grandparents around, they'd be happy to have your child, that's great. But not everybody's in that privileged situation. So it's kind of really hard as well. 
it's very hard to leave your child when you're mum, I guess, and your dad, I'm sure they're dad as well. But um, I, I've seen the surveys, about 35% uh, of women who said they did not go to conferences or workshops purely because of mum guilt. They did not want to leave the child behind. So that's obviously another layer of um, difficulty and struggles. And obviously, and physical, because obviously you, most of the time you're trying to kind of minimize your time away. So you're taking early, early uh, train or early flight and you're basically trying to minimize your time away, but then you are exhausted by traveling to kind of different time points to avoid being away from home for a long time. Um, and another thing is that Academia, as we all know, especially once you get to the level of being senior, like lecturer or professor, and you have to constantly apply for grants, constantly fund your research. It's almost very like being self-employed. You have to get, to get your research going to employ your staff, your te uh, technician staff, uh, technical staff, or your postdocs, uh, or even have PhD students. You need to constantly uh, seek funding, apply for that. And it's, we know work is, um, yeah, research work is very competitive environment, especially in the UK. We know it's one of the best um, research uh, in the world is it done in the UK. So everybody trying to come in here is very hard to get that funding. And uh, it is even though you've got your permanent stable job, it still kind of feel like you, you are a self-employed um, person. And another thing is we know the COVID, I think, is still kind of drugs and we still know the, the long-term effects. And I think there's been lots of studies found and surveys done and showed that obviously majority of household labor and childcare was just put into the older females, older women, and all the surveys showed that female academics, they published less, less papers, they submitted less papers, they've done less research, because obviously all comparing to the male peers, because obviously most of that childcare there has to be put uh, into women, but obviously again, that's like kind of the main breadwinner in the household situation. If let's say your partner um, um, earns more money, obviously you have to kind of sacrifice and compromise a bit more your work to be able to kind of manage it all and just work from home. And I cannot even imagine, I had only toddler at the time of COVID, I cannot imagine to do all the homeschooling while you're trying to work as well. So for all the parents who are having um, school aged children, that's another layer of difficulty. And I think a lot of people kind of, yeah, very struggle at the time of the, of the COVID and there's still kind of the, the gaps in the publication records, the gaps in your, your research work. It, is, it was quite challenging, for example, because I'm a behavioral scientist, I work with live animals, and um, yeah, our animal unit was closed, so I couldn't work for about eight months. Uh, so yeah, we tried to do as much as we could. I was furloughed as well in the end, because first of all, I couldn't work with a toddler sitting on my shoulder 24 seven, and while my husband was uh, doing constant teams and video calls with, with the, the, the clients. And again, we tried to do some shifts, but uh, because as you've got toddler and usually, younger children they got preference for the for the one parent and usually is the mom so i kind of have to during the day i had to obviously try to entertain him and play with him and do some work but my work was kind of started in the evening until 2 a.m in the morning to kind of manage manage that and that definitely kind of put a lot of strain on all the moms um and then the whole bias kind of the all whole societal expectations. I think this is kind of obviously more not just applies only to the research stuff in academia, but also a whole more working mums, the, how we kind of perceived by, by everybody around it. When, we, when you work, you, you ought to work like you have no children or be parent like you don't work. So you, I've had lots of comments that how can I work full time when I've got children? I should spend more time with my children, they are only little ones. But also, obviously, everybody likes to have a good career and happy children, obviously, good, good career as well. So if that balance is really hard and we kind of mothers are usually always perceived as kind of less reliable because obviously yeah, if your child is ill, you have to drop the experiment, you have to drop the study, you know, that's that's yeah, quite an ex expensive thing. And you have to have contingency plans, B, C, D and E. If that happens, if your child suddenly get a phone call from the nursery, they has got temperature, you have to stay at home. So, yeah, it's and it's a lot to think about that. I and mean, I, I can tell that a lot of mothers get that judgment that you, they should just, you know, prioritize the children, but sometimes, you know, they have to kind of balance that and it is quite tricky to, tricky to do. Um, and the last thing is kind of my, I would always say my favorite, I hope Tim is not going to be <laughs> annoyed about it, because um, the mother's hidden load. And uh, to all my friends with, with children, I always spoke, uh, I have never seen a partnership that would say is 50-50 share of the, that workload. So usually all the preparing, organizing, anticipating, booking, planning, what an emotional practical load that needs to get down where to obviously get your household run, get your children, get dressed in the nursery packed, PE kids, um, yeah, get your spare nursery packed lunches and stuff. So I did a little list 
and is above more than 40 items on my list, which I have to think regarding my children and my that, that, that everything that's regarding nursery or school or yeah, getting them um, to nursery or school while plus try, trying to do my full-time job as a, as a researcher and as a behavioral scientist. So it is very hard to don't, I, I wouldn't say, don't even start me on all the primary school birthday parties that never stop. So my children they usually get a better social life than me because obviously it's it's very, very a lot of things that kind of involve children. It just takes all of your weekends so you don't always get the time to kind of relax and, and it's just taken all the by um, your, your, your family um, family time. Um, and I don't want to be too pessimistic, so there's not all bad about um, being challenged, having lots of challenges as a research staff, but also there's a lot of advantage of being scientist and parent. So definitely you can have a lot more of flexible working pattern available in universities. So you can also have options of working from home. Obviously it depends on your nature of the research, I can't really do a lot of working from home because like, animals have to be every day in. We run experiments every day in. But however, I always try to kind of during the summertime when it's the um, school holidays uh, are on, it's obviously it's really hard to cover all the um, care during the school holidays. I try to not have animals then so I can do a bit more of working from home. But I think in different in science fields, you probably can do work a bit more flexible part in the working pattern. Um, and also universities got a lot of uh, very good inclusive policies. And sometimes when you look uh, or you talk to your friends from the and um, working in uh, private sectors, they don't get that many pairs, they don't get that many policies. So it's a lot of good things being working at a university and, and especially now with every university got the parents and carers network because they work really hard to kind of improve your life as a parent and, and a scientist. And also you can learn many skills, also you can transfer many skills from being a parent to scientist and from being science to parent. So you definitely get a lot of but much better at multitasking or organization. So you can plan things in advance, you can predict things in advance, you can um, you can get very better to be very well organizing at both, both fronts. And you get much better in troubleshooting. Sometimes with, when your toddler does not want to wear blue shoes and they want green shoes and you've got five minutes to leave, you have to kind of come up with the quick solutions, how to deal with that, how to compromise it. And also you much better in time planning. You know that you have to come in at work, you have to leave at five because you have to pick up um, one child from nursery, then race to the after school club, pick another child. So you can't just, yeah, um, try and play around or, um, with, uh, with colleagues or talk about, have a chat, discussions. You kind of, you have to become more productive. You have to be more focused and, and especially under time pressure. Um, and you kind of more organized to deliver stuff in a, in a short time. I remember I used to be kind of like, oh, okay, time this, I can write things and with a grant application and paper. Now I know I'm coming to work, I switch on into like writing mode, I have to do it. And then I have to leave, pick up um, my son from the nursery. So uh, you, you get definitely better at being a, a scientist and you kind of get more productive. Uh, but also obviously your life priorities change a lot when once you become a parent and your emotional intelligence um, develop further as well. So you'll become more empathetic and more understanding when you talk to your students, you, you become kind of more, um, help, I think, helpful. You kind of, you, you feel like the, the family situation or life situation is also as important as your work as delivering your objective for your scientific project or scientific grant. Uh, but also in small things, uh, like let's say my when my son was four, he, um, when we had a play date with uh, my friends from the, from the nursery, they, he kind of was shouting that, yeah, my mommy is a, a rat doctor. And he was so proud of it. I was kind of was he welling up. And I thought that moment, he knows that I'm a scientist. He knows I'm working with animals. And um, he was very proud of it. And it kind of felt for me was kind of this, this, this little sentence was more valuable for me than uh, how many papers I published, how many conferences uh, I attended and have, have been invited speaker. And the little things, the changes and, and the how you view it in the eyes of your child it kind of makes you kind of more valued and more um yeah more proud scientist than than you would say your colleagues would, will say that you're doing a great job um and then just a few funding opportunities i think this few has been mentioned before especially for the early career so in uk we've got daphne jackson fellowship that the fellowship allows to apply when you following career break so obviously when you've got much energy break or any longer career break you can get you back to track onto your science. And we've got also Dorothy Hodgkin Fellowships, which is very um, nice fitting for the parents because you can do your um, part-time fellowships. You don't have to work full-time, so you can kind of 
uh, fit your childcare around it. And um, we've also the, the very recent the Wellcome Trust Early Career Fellowship that's for all biomedical research. And it's, it's, it's good in that terms that it's kind of long term funding for five years or longer. So it kind of gives you that financial stability, gives you a bit like a catch of breath. Once you, when you get this funding, you can kind of, uh, yeah, potentially you can start planning your family. You've got a bit of um, space, space to breathe during your scientific career. Uh, another one is uh, L'Oreal UNESCO, especially for women in science. There's a, you can uh, apply for that. You can get obviously bridge funding. Uh, I think it's about up to ten thousand um, pounds. You can get uh, spend on the childcare or equipment or, um, to employ somebody to help you with your research. So um, yeah, it's very good um, funding opportunity if you try to find something that might fit you. And again, that's for all biomedical science and physics, all the research um, fields possible. To apply, there's also I found uh, recently Mothers in Science non-profit organization, and they provide caregiver travel grants. So those are grants that can help you to cover costs to to the travel to the different um, conferences or workshops. Um, and I looked at your biochemistry um, biochemical society website. I saw you got also very nice uh, care and assistance grants um, grants um, that provide funding to cover the yeah, childcare or um, any other needs. Um, needs are me needed meet needs and um, for the for the for the whether you want to go to your society meeting or training courses so that's very good um that obviously we can see more and more of that kind of care grants and not always every university provides that but it's good to the societies from different scientific um fields helps us so i can tell you from new science pharmacology field we've got um vp child care grant bna so that's british association for psychopharmacology and british New Science Association, so they do also provide at every meeting grants to cover the expenses associated with caring so the parents can come over. Um, also the IBRO, that's International Brain, I know this is not very relevant maybe from Biochemical Society, but just example, this one actually supports early career um, PI, so when you, obviously that's another level of uh, difficulty, not just uh, once you be, get that step further, be, become kind of more, um, yeah, more senior uh, academic, it kind of help you to, to fund and bridge um, some of them um, uh, to provide, yeah, to, to provide all the supplemental laboratory funding you need in that in that period of time. And so I'm sure there will more will come up. And I, I think the more well awareness we we um, we have about this this issue, the more fundings will going to be to be provided. And and uh, there's, there's I think hope that things will get better. I think in the last ten years things uh, improved dramatically for all the parents in um, in science. But I think the things will still be going better and better every time. Uh, and just a few bits of my advice. I think we we kind of have a similar advice, and um, Tim and Lean as well already showed you. And um, I would say the first one. I always um, I always uh, say that people people always tell me that I'm so pessimistic about being a parent, but I like to always say that I'm very realistic because everybody told us tells me it will get easier, it will get easier, but I don't think it will. I think it will get better. You have different challenges. So for example, when you don't have toddler anymore at the house, yes, you get more sleep. But then you've got all the challenges during the school age. But then you've got challenges when you, they become a teenagers. So I think you just in general, you just have to accept it's going to be hard. And that was for me, it was very hard um, to kind of, kind of get that into my, my uh, mindset that, yeah, I was kind of trying to battle that. How can I make it better? How can I make, make it my life easier and organize more? But I think it's going to be hard no matter what you do. And it's it always you have to just enjoy it. You just have to enjoy the only little ones. and. Um, you just have to make it work and make it and also you have to yeah enjoy both both um, uh, parenting and uh, being a scientist and as um, my previous speaker says as well ask for help support and collaborate so do not suffer on your own because that's a very easy way to to get burnt out and get mom burned out join the parents parents networks they always get a lot of support you can always get peer support it's always easier if you've got fellow parent who can always vent and they say uh, that you know you've got problems and i've got friends um, in our animal unit when we always come in on monday and i'm exhausted he's exhausted he's got three children and we kind of understand each other without even saying much and and you know it's always nice to know that uh yes uh the other people i know they've got struggles but also you know we're there for each other if he needs anything i can always help him and he can always help me so um yeah it's, it's really good to have that peer support network and it's always very good to ask for help support and when you've got your line manager or your PI or your colleagues at work, you know, they always, I'm sure they'll be happy to help. They know, you know, that if you struggle, they're definitely not going to just leave you there. Um, and also very good is to collaborate with different groups, different labs. 
and um, because obviously you don't want to have like let's say career break so you go on maternity leave have a big a publication uh, let's say gaps but also you can uh, just you know collaborate and you can do part of that publication with a different group of or do a different experiment and then you can publish so you've got the nice track record and you can publish together so there's a way to kind of get your nice career going even though you're going to have your um, maternity or paternity breaks and um, and then like, the next one is like Manvin said do not uh, overcommit learn to say no something which is not very kind of takes lots of time and lots of effort but it's not very impactful or beneficial to you I would always say just just learn to say no because then you're struggling trying to get everything uh, on time and you you're definitely going to impact your mental health as well and, and you get you're very exhausted and and again plan in advance yes discover your organization skills strategies for example I always on Sunday uh, wash all the PP kit, all the uniforms for a whole week. I've got all ready to just get dressed in the morning. The same for the nursery. So I plan everything the day. So I don't have to worry in the morning what they're going to wear, where the socks, where the shoes. So small things like that. And it just makes your uh, routine and your life flow much, much better, much easier. Um, and again, set boundaries between home, uh, home time and work. Especially now with people working flexibly, you can always get a lot of emails in the evening. You don't have to reply. You can just set your time. I know I've got the students even WhatsApp me on Facebook, message me, and I try to not reply unless something is very urgent. It's obviously, again, very different based on different your nature of your work. We obviously got live animals, so we have to kind of be 24 and uh, seven on call if something happened any health or welfare issue. So obviously we have to answer that. But if anything that's not urgent, I think just make sure that you got your boundaries because obviously people, especially students, will try to push and just try to like get answers a as soon as possible from you. Um, and I'll say that same, uh, I know that our advice is very kind of similar, weekly trash task and to-do list. Just prioritize as much as you can. Don't do things that you can do in six months. Just do, you know, things for that week. Makes you, again, much more uh, organized and productive to try as your things um, on a day, on a, on a weekly basis. And the last one, uh, I think I'm kind of guilty of not doing that myself, but definitely make time for yourself and look after yourself much more. And it's a bit like of the um, emergency kind of um, uh, emergency situations uh, on the plane when it always says you have to put your oxygen face mask first before you put face mask of your children. It's the same thing is with the self-care. If you don't look, do not look after yourself, you do not kind of get enough sleep, obviously, if you can, if you don't have um, toddlers or babies around. Um, if you kind of prioritize your mental and physical health, you definitely can do both. You can definitely be a good, good parent and you can definitely be a good scientist. And obviously, if you, yeah, be exhausted and burned out and really stressed out, that's definitely everything will fall like a domino. It'll be much harder, uh, much harder um, to do and and balance both. And hopefully, I did not overrun too much. And that's going to be my last slide. Thank you very much, Justina. It's, it's it was a lovely talk again, and it was really nice to have a um, sort of detailed slide on grants uh, i think that is quite informative especially for um new um parents so um i would like to start by asking a question to all of our delegates though um so we have talked about you know it's really nice that you all have got two children <laughs> under your belt and the experience that comes with it but how did you balance um, I'm unfortunate, unfortunately, unfortunately, one of those people I've never felt in my early career that I was ready financially or um, career wise to start my family. And I would say I, I had started my family a little later than the norm. So how did you all balance, you know, having a child early on in your career and still managing the progress uh, your career forward because it's not always the easiest is it so you know if we can have both um, perspectives from all of you that would be really great I personally think I think this is a decision um, you make based on you know you don't really for me personally I don't think I don't think I uh, looked at the circumstances so much I thought uh, when you're ready, there's no no perfect time. I think there's no perfect time. You just need to decide um, that you're going to do it and then work around that rather than thinking that, okay, now I'm ready and I should start. Um, I think uh, for me, my first child was during my postdoctoral. Um, it was 
tougher than being a faculty so the second one and with the second child i think it will become easier too because you're now used to um, you know organizing yourself as a parent and doing things you know what it entails uh, but um, yeah i think it's more like you need to plan it and then work around it rather than thinking that you are ready now due to that but there could be other aspects you and your partner both should you know that's the priority you should agree and um such some of the things you should take care of is whether you can manage that uh, you know responsibility at that time with your other things and finances i think these are some of the things okay so academically then let's let's rephrase my question so academically what is the biggest tip that you can give to people who's having that dilemma um well i think I, I personally think uh, I have done it as a postdoc and as a faculty, so I don't think it's uh, something you need to decide based on where you are academically or what you're doing. Uh, you you plan it and then work according to it. But do think that you you need to make sure you have that support system out there. If you think you're in a position where you don't have a supportive mentor or a supportive work, I don't think it will be uh, it's it's going to be easier for you. I think I kind of I, I would like a very little disagree with that because you can't always plan when you're going to have a baby. So that's a bit yeah. I think another layer because you you can plan as much as you want and it's not always going to yeah might not happen as soon as when you when you want to yeah have a baby. But I think there's never a good time. I had my first child when I was in the third year of my PG, and I had my second one when I was postdoc. So I think that both times are really hard to, to there's like like being said, there's never a good time because when you finish your PhD, you don't really want to have a toddler when you're writing up, which is exactly what I did. And then when you start a new project, you don't really want to say a week later, oh, oh, sorry, I'm pregnant and I'm going to be away for such a long time. And the PIs, they're not going to just be the happiest about it. Again, you can't really, yeah, you can't, you, you don't want to really plan it at the end of the contract because again, you know, might not be eligible for the maternity leave because your contract will end. So I don't think it's ever a good time <laughs> to have. You just have to find the time it works for you and for your personal situation, for your man mindset, for whatever your and your partner thing is the best when you want to do it. And I think it's it's very difficult that question to answer. But again, um, I found uh, yeah, especially the, the the first one. Yeah, I was writing my <laughs> dissertation till two a.m. in the morning every day because obviously I was working. I was finishing some experiments and after he's gone to sleep i was doing my dissertation trying to do as well during the day uh, but yeah it, it was really hard and i think kind of always people underestimate how toddlerhood is difficult <laughs> everybody says about how babies are hard how you was hard i think actually that age from one to three i think that's the peak hardest that's from my experience i don't know how old it says it is i think once they get to school age it gets a bit easier obviously they start sleeping through the night and you know the old but they, again they're all the challenges but i think you're going back from maternity leave and you've got that peak <laughs> toddlerhood on you and it is i think difficult anytime you just have to find look at again yeah your financial situation your personal situation and also when you emotionally ready as well because that is going to be a big big change big step just for being a yeah, happy single person going on holidays and uh, etc and then you have to look after your child 24 7 basically <laughs> once you got them with you yeah, so i don't know what um tim's opinion about that from yeah. different sides yeah, i mean I, I agree with everything you both said like it that, i mean there's never quite you know the perfect time you just adapt but the main thing is that you and your partner are just on board with it that you make the decision together you realize there might be sacrifices but if you're both open to that you just you roll with it and yeah, you just make those decisions depending on your circumstances. But I feel it's yeah, you're both happy to go for it um, emotionally and stability. the other things you you can try and you can make work. But yeah, to sort of constantly be putting it off for something else, there's always going to be there's always going to be something that pops up. So yeah, as long as you're both on the same page and you realise you know say there might be you know sacrifices in my case I, I wasn't up for the commute to london and just being there on the weekend i was my partner rightly and um yeah we just worked that out and came up with a solution and so yeah it's it's say it's it's two of you involved in this and you've got to you've got to make sure 
you're both on the same page and then yeah just make it work from there yeah yeah definitely and i guess being in a supportive environment at work is is a key thing because no matter how well you plan unless you have got a supportive environment around you that's going to help manage your um you know responsibilities and how you come back as well which is again overlooked you know women coming back from maternity leave and how they are affected intellectually and how their career is back and that flat tire <laughs> you're all yeah, exactly. always yeah. Yes, i think the best depiction of parenting <laughs> so i think i think if i were to give anyone one advice it would be making sure that if they obviously willing to carry on with their career is to make sure that they're in the right environment for it um okay so the next question is to tim so um there is a question from the audience saying whether he would you know you have regretted leaving any of this or any of your past roles uh, it's a good question and i can honestly say no to be honest like um you know i had a great time um my wife was similar careers but we're very lucky that but there was that period obviously in glasgow where my wife struggled to find um employment but our sort of careers have kind of mirrored each other so at the point where i moved from glasgow back to bristol we were in the same points in their career she was doing exactly the equivalent to me it was no breadwinner we're on even par and it just you know it made sense she had made that sacrifice for me going to glasgow um and yeah it was my turn and I was happy to do it to do the equivalent and it wasn't really a sacrifice it was just a different role um, and the amount of groups I sort of went to I was so lucky that we live in Bristol whereas um, I would see dad at play groups and stuff and they were actively there because they wanted to be there and unfortunately I mean in Glasgow I didn't get too much time to go to many but the few that I did go to it was it was constantly people searching for their post and wanting to get back into stuff but after that you know, post in London that I was like, no, actually, you know what, um, I'm I'm good for a bit. Um, yeah, just embrace that. And it was just, it was really lovely. And say it's environment network. Again, we picked Bristol as a place where sort of the quality and stuff is a bit better in terms of, um, yeah, say child parent, um, you know, um, care and stuff. And so I was really lucky. I made plenty of mum friends and plenty of dad friends and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't change anything and say that I've still got these opportunities now going back into research. Daphne Jackson was fantastic. I've got this funding on the side. I still have my own old contacts who every so often mention jobs. I'm like, well, I'm okay at the moment. So it's not, it's not close the door. And yeah, I feel I just, I wouldn't change it. I, I, I really enjoyed that portion of my life. Yeah. And I, I guess, like you say, or like we've been saying throughout this webinar, our circumstances as a parent changes constantly. You know, five years down the line, probably your you know, kids will be at teenagers and they wouldn't want to see any of their parents. So you have more time in your hands and you can always switch yeah. your role. Well, that's um, it. We're, we're very lucky in research. I mean, it might not be for everyone, but in terms of the longevity of careers, um, you know, some sort of manual jobs and stuff where the sort of, Kind of time frame in terms of your body being able to cope but um as long as your mind stays fresh i feel a lot of my colleagues peers they're yeah they're still very active for, for many more years so i don't really feel this closing curtains as such but at the period of life where i am this this post is yeah just sort of perfect in terms of finding the balance and let's say these are good years i know some people who work relentlessly until retirement saying that they'll they'll relax and enjoy retirement and Sadly, I've, you know, I know some people who, um, yeah, yeah, not had that many years after they've retired. So it's, it's yeah, it's finding that balance. And it's, again, everyone's different priorities. In my case, um, yeah, the research I enjoyed, but um, also just enjoyed time with my family. So I've been very fortunate. Lovely. And as the last point with regards to the webinar, I would like to, you know, sort of uh, pick your brain or, you know, dive into your experience in terms of, parents and carer networks so um you know from what you tim and justina have said it's very clear that there is an active network in bristol so how about in boston manveen do you have a similar network um 
I mean, I haven't really looked for uh, a big network. We do have like friends and families around and uh, that kind of helps equally, you know, having your friends and uh, their kids and having that network. And uh, also your kids, when they go into like daycare or schools, you build a network with their um, friends and the family there. So I think um, I, I with the time we have, I think having networking at personal level is something we have been doing rather than joining any groups or things like that. Okay, okay, lovely. So for those, you know, obviously research is very global and people might not have the luxury of having a lot of friends or relatives around or family around. So just back to Justina and Tim, you know, how active is your network in Bristol and what are the things that you're doing to help um, parents or carers? I've just, just very recently joined, but I know that our, for example, breastfeeding policies have changed. Now we've got uh, breastfeeding rooms, we've got quiet rooms in the building. So if you're pregnant and you feel tired, exhausted, you can go and lie down, have a bit of peace. You don't have to kind of struggle between your colleagues in the office. Uh, you can go, yeah, you can go express, uh, go into breastfeeding room. We can also, um, I think now we've got change about our um, children in buildings policies have changed to kind of a bit more restricted. But uh, you, you're welcome to go into like the nursery and breastfeed there if you wanna, if you wanna during your work time for a little bit come back. So that definitely helps. Um, we're doing kind of now uh, in person an online meetup so parents can share their um, experiences. They can talk about things. We've our recent meeting we had a bit of a um, few few ideas. Let's say I don't know do some. Uh, clothes swap and things like that so obviously we've got so many things at home can we do a swap between the parents and um, and also um, I know I kind of very uh, kind of involved the nursery so and so I kind of trying liars between our parents parents and our university nursery so we're trying to kind of change the kind of our priority list who can get the space of the nursery obviously we've got students as a top priority then staff but also we're trying to kind of change a little bit so the research staff that on short-term contracts or visiting academics they will be able to get that opportunity to be at the nursery because we know it's really hard to get space and like I said we have 12 to 18 months list to get the space I think the last person on our list is from July 2022 which is absolutely crazy so if you're coming for a one-year uh, contract you just there's not a chance you can get the space and I'm not sure how the local nursery situation is but I think it's the same is I think a big struggle and the same with the getting to schools so we're kind of trying to from different angles trying to kind of get more support and um, I'm not sure if Tim uh, knows a bit more because I've very recently joined the, the, the parents committee but I know from the university nursery and we're trying to kind of expand a bit more and we kind of do some kind of like new science I did new science session for the nursery so we do a bit of public outreach for the for the children in nursery from in different fields. So we're kind of trying to get a parents network close with with the yeah for the university as well. Okay, yeah, so no, I think that's oh, I was gonna say that's perfectly summarized. I think we joined not too dissimilar a time and I oh, think I'm actually similar, yeah. <laughs> I liked all the uh, all the different pros of it. I mean there's also an online forum where ideas pop up and uh, people can share things but as Christina said okay. those people come in on short contracts and stuff you know not maybe with work and stuff having those chance to have those meetups if their kids are doing that after school or they, they don't get to go to play groups because of work offers another network where people can really sort of share ideas or experiences with um, parents in a similar yeah. situation with them. so yeah that way it's yeah, i think we've got yeah. one blog one staff member i think that's amazing so it's a, one of the, our staff um she puts a blog together what you can do with your kids during half term so i think that's the best thing because you don't have to think and plan and and you've got full list and ideas and you while you're trying to do your research trying to plan what to do in half term or summer holidays it actually yeah. really is the small things but they're really helpful to having all the parents so yeah so yeah. they're little things Lovely. like that that's Okay, well, I would like to thank everyone who did uh, stick with us uh, until this time, and I would like to thank our um, speakers for their time and for sharing their experiences with us uh, today. So the uh, conversation doesn't need to stop here. You can continue the conversation online by following uh, Biochem Society, Biochem Sop, and PP Publishing on Twitter on X. So we do welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in um, Biochemistry Focus webinar series. So if you have an idea for a webinar in 2024, 
Uh, we do invite uh, proposals for upcoming webinars, so you can find more information on the website and you can also watch previous recordings and this recording when it's available as well. So all of our upcoming webinars are listed on the website and if you have missed any of the webinars, again, as part of the series, you can access to them on the website or on the YouTube channel. Uh, so our next webinar will be on the 18th of June at 2 BST and the, our new webinar is on insights into membrane information on organisation. So we ha will have two early career researchers who will provide a closer look into glycolipids and the molecular regulation of secretory granule and exosome formation. So finally, I would like to highlight that it is more important than ever to stay connected and engage with your fellow uh, scientists, molecular bioscientists. So please join the Biochemical Society's community of researchers and specialists and take advantage of key benefits, uh, which include discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings and exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries. Um, so for more please visit their website and uh, i would like to thank everyone and uh goodbye thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.